Evening. How are you doing? Good. Are we good? Was that an uh? <laughs> oh dear, I'm sorry about that. Uh, I'll try and keep you awake. Um, do keep that passage open in front of you. 2 Timothy chapter 3. As Rick said, we are in the second of this little mini-series we're doing called When Christians Disagree. And uh, if you have been uh, following the news at all uh, this week, you will know why it is we're doing a series like this one right now. Uh, The bishops of the Church of England issued a little bit of pastoral guidance around uh, equal marriage, same-sex marriage, and uh, half the Church of England almost, it seems, decided to go absolutely ballistic in response to their advice. Um, But it's not just the wider church that uh, occasionally has... A disagreement or two. Um, for us here at uh, St. Paul's, this series was um, uh, prompted, if you like, by the recent appointment of a new curate, which we're really excited about. Alexandra is coming to uh, minister here in July. And we realized, uh, as we considered this appointment, that we hadn't really talked about the issue of women in leadership at all as a church. And uh, that's because uh, there are uh, so many things that we agree on that we tend to focus on those things. But actually, this was something that we realized that we, um, we didn't want to ignore. We wanted to intentionally kind of navigate and explore the different points of view that there are within the church. And, uh, and to recognize that our difference is a very good thing, something to celebrate. And, uh, and perhaps tonight you're sitting there and you're thinking, I, you know, I have no idea what I think at all about women in leadership. I've never given it a second thought. Uh, or maybe you're sitting there thinking, I cannot believe that we've decided to appoint a woman into leadership. What are they doing? Uh, or perhaps you're thinking, I can't believe they even had a conversation about it. Isn't that an obvious thing that should have been done years ago? Well, any of those positions, that's actually, it's okay. Because Christians disagree. So the question for us is, as uh, as we're exploring together in this series, is when we disagree, how should we do it? Last week, uh, Rick looked at uh, when Christians disagree in the church, and he explored Philippians 2 and talked about uh, the importance of being like-minded, that unity that we share in Christ by the Spirit, and, uh, and the need for humility to consider one another better than ourselves. This week, we're looking at when Christians disagree about the Bible, which is why we're looking at this passage from 2 Timothy. And of course, there are so many different approaches to the Bible, different ways of reading it, different interpretations, difficult passages to get stuck on. Some of us will get stuck on this particular passage. Others of us will get stuck on this particular passage. What are some of the ground rules that we can set for us as a community at SPS that can help us to have these disagreements and disagree well? And we're going to look this evening uh, at two parts. We're going to uh, look at what it means when we say the Bible is holy and what we mean when we say the Bible is inspired And in each part, we'll have one truth, two virtues. And they'll come up on the screen behind me. But before we get there, uh, let me pray for us tonight. Father, uh, you're a God who speaks, and we love to hear your voice. And Lord, you have called us together as your people in this place. And uh, we don't always agree, um, but we learn together. We grow together as we wrestle with your word. And we pray tonight, Lord, speak to us uh, as, as your people, as your children, whom you love that we might be transformed by that experience. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So verse 15, Paul says to Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures. He's saying the Bible is holy. He's talking here about sacred writings. In essence, he means the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, but you see how he says they are summed up In Jesus. So, what he's saying here is the whole of Scripture, Old and New Testament, is holy. But what does it mean to say the Bible is holy? To say it's holy, he's saying that Scripture is set apart, it's sanctified by God. To be holy is to be set apart for a particular purpose, it's to be dedicated to God. It's saying that God uses this book that has been dedicated to him for his purposes. 
The Bible is exactly as God intended it to be. It's human writings, different types of writings written at different times, but God employs it. He puts it to work. And, Paul wants us to understand, it does its job. It's effective. Look at verse 15. It makes you wise for salvation. The Bible is holy. So what? What does that mean in practice? One truth, two virtues. Firstly, the truth. It means the Bible is clear. You see, God uses the Bible to speak to us. Now, that might be obvious to you. It might not. God reveals himself in Jesus. God reveals Jesus to us through the scriptures. And that means that God reveals himself to us through the scriptures. So we meet God in the pages of the Bible. God reveals himself to us through scripture. And God doesn't need an expert, a translator, as he reveals himself to us. So the Bible can be understood by everyone. Look at verse 17. All God's people. That's who it's for. It's for all God's people. So you don't need experts. You don't need theologians or priests or pastors telling you what to think. What you need is the Holy Spirit. All of us, we all need the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who illuminates the page, who helps us make sense of what the Bible is saying. It helps us to understand Scripture. I had an experience of this when I was a, a new Christian. So I was probably only 16 or 17. My brother had just become a Christian too. And we were just kind of discovering the Bible for the first time, fascinated by it, but mystified by it too. And uh, I remember we uh, were working our way through uh, probably the most complex book <laughs> of the Bible, which was the book of Romans, written by Paul. And we wanted to get a sense of what it was he was saying. And we had found ourselves in perhaps the, the longest, most complex section of that book, which is Romans chapters 9 to 11. It's really one whole argument. And we decided that what we would have to do if we were going to get some sense of what he was saying was just sit down together and plow straight through it. So we commandeered the dining room. We sat down together with three or four different translations. And over about five hours, we just worked through it and came to a view about what it meant. Now, I've read a lot of commentary since that time on Romans. I've got a lot on my shelf. I still think we were pretty much there with our particular interpretation of that passage because we, he was clear. We could understand what he was saying even as relatively new Christians. And if that sounds pretty daunting, I certainly think the big picture of the Bible is something that all of us can grasp. You might consider it to be kind of six chapters, creation, fall, Israel, Jesus, church, the chapter that we are part of now, and then new creation, the chapter that's yet to come. What Paul is, wants us to understand is that the Bible makes sense. So in light of that, what are the virtues that we need to cultivate? There are two. The first is perseverance. The second is community. So the first virtue, we need to read the Bible with perseverance. Look at verse 14. Continue in what you have learned from, intimacy, uh, from infancy. Paul is saying to Timothy here, look, uh, in order to understand this Bible, it's possible, but in order to understand it, you've got to study it, and it's a process of lifelong learning. But it's worth it. It's something you can do. It's not a code. It's not mysterious. You don't need a key to get in to unlock it. Actually, you can use your common sense and understand it in a straightforward, plain way. It's what the theologians call the plain meaning or the literal meaning of the text. So John Wesley said this, it's a stated rule in interpreting, never depart from the plain literal sense unless it implies absurdity. That's a good rule. There's not a special code that we need to unpack or decipher. We can read it as it is and it can speak to us because it's clear. But just because it's clear doesn't mean that process is easy. Understanding the Bible is hard work. We have to be honest about that. It takes time. 
It takes effort. There are really no shortcuts. But we're not alone in that. That's the good news. So right from the very beginning, writers, um, readers have found it challenging to understand the Bible. So Peter himself, uh, the first um, leader of the early church, found it difficult to understand Paul. So if you look at his second letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, he says, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. So if you think that, I do, we're in good company, because Peter thought it too. So what are some practical ways that, we, that might help us work through those bits that seem to be less clear, more difficult to understand than others? Well, I would say don't move too quickly to outside sources, books about the Bible. And begin by uh, looking at other parts of Scripture that are perhaps clearer, that shed light on those bits that are a little bit more challenging. Allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Use the clear verse to help interpret the more difficult verse. And work at it. That's what Paul encourages Timothy to do. Uh, Earlier in his second letter, chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Present yourself to God as one approved who correctly handles the word of truth. So make the effort. Be patient with it when it gets difficult, when you feel like you've got stuck. Keep going. Try again. Ask for help. There's lots of resources that we can point you to. So that's the first Virtue, persevere. Read it with perseverance. The second virtue is read it together. Read it in community. Look at verse 14 again. You know those from whom you learned it. We read the Bible together. This idea of the Bible is clear and that any of us can understand it is not a free-for-all. Uh, Protestantism often gets um, criticized for this. It talks about Protestantism's dangerous idea, this kind of free market of individual views that means you can never say that interpretation's right, that one isn't. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He's saying to us, actually, yes, it's, each of us can read the text because the Spirit illuminates the text for us and helps us understand it, but the church is the temple of the Spirit, So we need to read it as the living stones of the temple. We need to read it with others. We need to listen to different points of view. We need to listen to what others have to say, particularly those who have a different perspective, a different interpretation to us. So, Paul says to Timothy, you have known the holy scriptures. Scripture is clear. We can understand it. So we need to cultivate the virtues of perseverance and community. Second thing he says, verse 16, all scripture is God breathed. He's saying there the Bible is inspired. It's breathed out or spirated. Now what does that mean? Well, Peter again helps us here in his second letter. In chapter 1, uh, verses 20 to 21, in case you're taking notes, he says this. You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what he's saying is the Bible was written by human beings, a particular person in a particular time, in a particular place, uh, to a particular audience, for a particular purpose, in a particular style, but all of that is carried along by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who energizes it. It is all moved by him. It's driven, that whole process is driven by the Holy Spirit. So we can say that this human writing comes from God. It's a, a work of the Holy Spirit. And because it is inspired, we can say with confidence the Bible is revelation. The Bible is the word of God, which is exactly what Paul calls it in this reading that we're looking at tonight when he says to Timothy in chapter 4, verse 2, preach the word. He's saying preach preach the gospel, preach the Bible. So scripture is God-breathed. So what? What's the truth and the virtues that come out of that. Well, the truth is this. The Bible has 
authority. God exercises his authority through the Bible. Now, authority isn't a word we like very much in our culture, is it? Um, But here he's not talking about uh, power or organization or control. This is not a a mandate for the thought police, the the theological policemen that have got a long list that you need to tick off to make sure you're reading the Bible rightly. No. God exercises his authority in judgment. He condemns sin and evil and injustice and liberates humanity to be fully human, fully alive. That's what his authority is all about. So look at uh, 3 verse 16 in this letter, second letter to Timothy. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Not in right understanding, but in righteousness. So that all God's people may be thoroughly equipped to pass the comprehension test. To be able to say, I scored 99 out of 100 Bible answer questions? questions? No. He's saying, equipped for every good work. Yeah, so God's authority, it's not oppressive. It is liberating. It's about uh, freedom. It's about human flourishing, our potential, the fullness of life. So the Bible has authority, and that's a good thing. But what virtues do we need to cultivate in response to that authority? Well, I think there are two, courage and humility. So the first virtue, we need to read the Bible with courage. And that means we need to be courageous enough to wrestle with the difficult texts, what some theologians call texts of terror. We need to tackle them head on. And I haven't always done this. So I remember when Joanne and I uh, got married, uh, we, uh, were, we were being married by our pastor, and uh, he was talking to us about the service beforehand, and uh, he said, you know, what, do you have a particular Bible passage you'd like me to preach on? And we said to him, not really, no, but just uh, don't preach on Ephesians 5. We don't like Ephesians 5. Uh, we disagree with Ephesians 5. Paul was wrong, so uh, you can preach on whatever you like, just not Ephesians 5. And he looked rather strangely at us and said, okay, um, and preached on from Genesis. Now, 10 years later, I've got a, a deeper understanding and appreciation of Ephesians 5. And I realized that Paul wasn't wrong. I was wrong. And so actually, I've preached on Ephesians 5 at Christ Church. I've preached on Ephesians 5 here. I've preached on Ephesians 5 at somebody's wedding. You see, the truth is, is For us who believe the Bible has authority, rejection of a particular text in it is not really an option for us. We can't really say that Paul was confused or wrong, that he had a a terrible view of women, that he was misogynistic. Neither can we really pretend that these texts are not in the Bible because they are there. We have to deal with it as it is. We might wish they weren't there, but there they are. So we we can't really pick and choose. We can't ignore passages of Scripture. Paul here says to Timothy, all Scripture is useful. It's profitable for all of us, for the church across the ages, even if it's not clear to us today, right now, how that could possibly be. So we need courage to wrestle with these difficult texts. We need courage to challenge different interpretations So Paul charges Timothy, preach the word. He says, in effect, if you disagree with what you're hearing, say so. Challenge them, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season, correct, rebuke, and encourage, but do it with great patience and careful instruction. So if you disagree, that's okay, say so. Rebuke, correct, encourage, but do it carefully. Think the best of the person that you are in disagreement with. Don't stereotype them. Don't caricature them. Don't demonize them. So I'm very happy to confess to you tonight that I am a feminist. And I'm a feminist because of the Bible. 
Now, some people will say to me, Rod, actually, you're a feminist because you've compromised with culture. You've capitulated to the culture around us and the cultural pressure. And I just ask us as we have this conversation to say, actually, I'm going to respect Rod's claim that he's a feminist because he believes the Bible, even if I might disagree with that. Does that make sense? So if somebody else is a complementarian or whatever they might be, it's incumbent upon me not to think, well, they're just sexist. Actually, they're just trying to be faithful to the same Bible that I'm trying to be faithful to, but we come to different conclusions. And it takes courage to recognize that. So that's the first virtue. The second virtue, we need to read it with humility. Why? Well, because we are all different. Different genders, ethnicities, cultures, histories, education, experiences. All of those things shape what we bring to the text as readers. Now, I am a father of two daughters. That has sharpened my passion about the issue of women in leadership. And I need to be honest about that. All of us need to be honest about the perspectives that we bring. Because each of us only has one vantage point, and there are many. Now, I'm not saying for a moment that every vantage point is equally valid. Some vantage points are better than others. But we need to recognize that we all see in part, because we're all different. And we're also all students of the Bible, right until the very end. We never graduate from Bible college in that sense. We are all still learning, and we can all get it very wrong. And we need to be able to acknowledge that. So even great evangelical theologians of the past have got it wrong. I was reading yesterday about some of the, um, the early church fathers, like St. Augustine and, and St. Jerome. St. Augustine is one of my heroes, but his views of women are appalling, absolutely appalling. But he is a product of his own culture and time. Charles Hodge, another of my heroes, I've got his systematic theology on my shelf, two volumes, fantastic, knows more about the Bible, more about theology than I can ever possibly dream or imagine. He was writing in the 19th century. He wrote a pamphlet called The Bible Argument on Slavery in 1836, and he was uh, opposed to abolition. And this is what he said. As it appears to us too clear to admit of either denial or doubt that the scriptures do sanction slaveholding, so to declare it to be a heinous crime is a direct impeachment of the word of God. A reformed theologian, an evangelical, was saying to the abolitionists that if they sought to abolish slavery, they were impeaching the Bible. No one thinks that anymore. He got it wrong. And that means we've got to be humble enough to recognize that we might have got it wrong and got it wrong seriously for a very long time. So we've got to be like the Bereans in the book of Acts who hear the gospel from Paul and they receive the message with eagerness, but they examine the scriptures to make sure what he's saying is right. They have this ongoing openness This self-awareness, they're self-critical because they're reading with humility. So Paul says to Timothy, the Bible is inspired, it has authority, so we need to cultivate the virtues of courage and humility. So just to wrap it all up. Paul is saying here, the Bible is clear. He's talking about holy scriptures. In, In terms of the issue of women in leadership, it means... Don't ignore it. Work it through yourself. Persevere with what the Bible says. What do you think the Bible says about this issue? And let's learn together as a community. That's why we've got this series setting out the ground rules so we can have the conversation. There's going to be an opportunity to uh, participate in a seminar in a, a little while. It may be that you want to explore it in your connect group or your small group. and We'd encourage you to do that. But also the Bible has authority. All scripture is God-breathed. And so what that means is we need to wrestle with these texts when we're looking at the issue of women in leadership, not reject them. 
And we need to have the courage to disagree well and, to be, and the humility to be prepared to change our minds. And you might be sitting there thinking, Rod, this, you know, what a process to be going through. Do I really want to begin that process? Do I want to make that effort? Well, you know, when Christians disagree about the Bible, it's worth it. Because that's how we discover new things. That's how we hear God speaking to us in ways that we've never heard before. And the truth is, when God speaks to us through the Bible, it changes our lives. Look at what Paul says. It makes you wise for salvation, he says in verse 15. It trains you in righteousness, he says in verse 16. It thoroughly equips you for every good work in verse 17. You see, Timothy could see the impact of the Bible on Paul's life, and it blew him away. If you want to follow God, you need to read the Bible. It's as simple as that. Why don't we stand?